Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We're back in Ephesians tonight. Romans, Lord willing, on Sunday. Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Gentiles, notice. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, would. How that by revelation revealed, he made known unto me, to Paul, the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. Whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. There's a mystery that was revealed to Paul. We're reading about it here. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That the Gentiles, here's the mystery, should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made, sorry, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. What a chapter. We're picking up from verse 6. Verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So the Gentiles get in on it. It's no longer just to the Jews. It's to Jew and Gentile. They become Christians. They get into the body of Christ. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, there's one body, not many, like the hyper-dispensationists teach, there's one body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Turn to Galatians 3, 28. Galatians 3, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. The Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. They're in Christ. Gentiles are getting saved. Paul is called to the Gentiles. The apostle to the Gentiles. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, 
verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, not two bodies, not three bodies, by the cross. One body, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Rockman in his notes on on 2.16, his reference Bible says this. This is the mystery Paul discusses in Ephesians 3, verse 1 to 6. We've just read it. How the Gentiles get into the body of Christ, no longer just to the Jews. The body of Christ composed of both Jews and Gentiles. Look at Ephesians 2, 11 to 14. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you're either in Christ or outside of Christ, ye who were, who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So the body of Christ, composed of both Jews and Gentiles, doesn't begin with Paul. It doesn't begin with Paul. So we're not hyper-dispensational. We are balanced, Bible-believing Christians that believe in the different dispensations, that we have to rightly divide the word of truth, but we're not hyper. We don't think the church started with Paul, as the hypers do. It doesn't begin in Acts 9, 13, 18, or 28. And whether you take Bullinger, or whether you take Stam, or whether you take Moore, or Colic Colwell and his pastor, whoever you take, they'll all have their little slant on this. They think they've got a little corner of truth that they think the body started in Acts. It didn't. All, as all hyperdispensationalists teach, the one body, not two or three, and if you're going to be hyperdispensational, you have to add bodies to it. Because you've got a section and it's a section of transition, you have a section pre-Acts, and um, when Peter and James and, and these um, apostles are getting saved, so I have to make up another body, it has to be another body, pre the body of Christ. They have to twist and distort the scriptures to teach these heresies. The one body was made possible at Calvary. It started at Calvary. The members of the local church were placed into that body at Pentecost. And the church was converted into his body. Turn to Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. One body, one church here. And the body is the church. So you need to get that. And don't let them talk you out of it. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, one body, which is the church, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The mystery of the Jew and Gentile in one body, the body of Christ, began in Acts 2. Yet, although a way was made for the formation of the body by Christ's finished work of atonement at Calvary. So it starts at Calvary, but they were baptised, as he said there, um, Pentecost. Uh, The members of the local church were placed into that body at Pentecost. Do you get that? Although a way was made for the formation of the body by Christ's finished work of atonement at Calvary. This was unknown to the apostles and prophets of Acts 1-7. to And Peter purposely speaks of sins being blotted out at the second advent. Turn to Acts 3, verse 19. Somebody read that, please. Acts 3, 19. Peter purposely speaks of sins being blotted out at the advent, not Calvary. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Acts 3.19. 
when the times of depression shall come from the Beautifully read. Do you realise that's going to go around the world? You're going to have job offers from news readers and casters all over now. So Peter purposely speaks of sins being blotted out at the advent. Note that down. Advent, not Calvary. The body could not be formed until Christ's physical body had gone back to glory. Even though the body is formed, the Lord chooses to withhold revelation. He doesn't reveal it. He withholds revelation about the true nature of the transaction until he calls out the apostle to the Gentiles. Turn to Romans 16. Somebody read Romans 16, verse 25. Romans 16, 25. He was the apostle to the Gentiles, it was revealed to Paul. The truth lay dormant, even in the Old Testament, and was not revealed to the writers. Turn to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1, verse 11 and 12. Somebody read that, please. So this information wasn't revealed until Paul reveals it here. The mystery of the Jew and Gentile in one body. 1 Peter 1, verse 11 and 12. Searching what, or what matter of time, the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things, which are now reported unto you by them, that have preached the gospel unto you, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into, 1 Peter 1, verse 11 and 12, thank you. So they didn't fully get it. It talks about the sufferings of Christ there. First advent, the glory, second advent. One verse. There was a local church before Acts chapter 2. You need to remember this as well and understand this. Turn to Matthew 18, verse 17. Because you're only going to get run into a hyper-dispensatious and they're going to try and talk you out of what you believe. There's one body. But there was a local church before Acts chapter 2. Matthew 18, verse 17. Somebody read that, please. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it into, into the church. Tell it unto the what? Church. So there's a local church before Acts 2. Thank you, Matthew 18, 17. But in Acts 2, it becomes, listen, it becomes a living organism by the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's a local church previous, but it becomes a living organism the spiritual body of Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter, James and John were in it before Paul. Did you get that? Peter, James and John were in it before Paul. Turn to John 17. John chapter 17. And look at this, verse 6 to 12. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou, gave, which thou hast given me. For they are thine, and all mine are thine, and, and thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. And now I come no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep, that, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, 
that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may be- believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them. There it is. And thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. There was a local church before this living organization, this living organism, not an organization like the JWs, an organism. We'll talk about that. Maybe in a bit. Romans 16, 7. Look at this. Romans 16. Romans 16. One body. Not two bodies. Not one pre and one after. One body. The church. Romans 16, verse 7. Salute Andronicus and Junior, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles. Among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me, before Paul. So the body of Christ existed before Paul. I have a cross-reference there of Galatians 1.13. Galatians 1.13. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past, in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. So the church of God was before Paul. Before Paul was even saved. And John 17, 21 and 23, we've just read. So in Acts 2, as Rotman wrote, the members of the local church were placed into the body at Pentecost. The local church were placed into the body of Christ at Pentecost by the Holy Spirit. And the church was converted into his body. One body. So there's a difference there. The local church and the body of Christ. And they were baptised into the body of Christ at Pentecost. So in Acts 2 it became a living organism by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter, James and John were in it before Paul was, even though they may not have fully understood then the one body. And some of us don't even understand that even today. Galatia, uh, Ephesians 3, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, this is the mystery, and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. One gospel that we preach today. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 4, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And by preaching that, Jews get saved, Gentiles get saved, and baptised, 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen into the body of Christ. This living organism, not an organisation, an organism. It's funny, isn't it? You look on the JW Kingdom Halls and they've got JW.org. That's organisation. But we're not an organisation. We're an organism. We are a living organism. That's what the body of Christ is. Verse 7. Whereof I was made a minister... Paul was called by God to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, this gift that was dispensed to him, dispensation, dispensed to him. And how he had to go to the other apostles and explain what had happened. That was in Galatians uh, chapter 1, chapter 2, where he, I think it's chapter 1, where he goes into, is it Arabia, and spends that time, and the Lord reveals these things to him. And then he goes to the apostles and explains that things are different. People keep running to Acts 2.38, but Acts 2.38 was only ever preached once in Scripture. Just once. We're not preaching that gospel. That's not for us. That was for Jews then, in that specific time. Preached by a Jew, to Jews. And we being Gentiles are now fellow heirs in the same body through the gospel, through Jesus Christ. We are in Christ as much as the apostles were. It's amazing when you think about it. We are thus made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Isn't it interesting, made a minister? We have government ministers, we have all kinds of ministers, ministers of the church, ministers, servants, people doing things. 
People love titles. We said this before, you know, you beware of flattering titles, the, the Bible says. People love to be called pastor and elder and deacon. They love those and bishop and that. That's why we shy away from them. We're not. We're just a little group of Christians here that have a Bible study. People love titles. I'm not into all that stuff. <clears throat> We're ministers. We're all ministers in different ways. You're all gifted in different ways. You all have your calling. We're all part of the body of Christ. Nobody's any better than anybody else. God calls us to do a job. You all have different talents. You know, we don't do, perhaps we don't, you know, um, we don't, can't do the same things. You know, a lot of you are much gifted in many areas than I am. And uh, you do what you, God calls you to do, and you'll be blessed with it. And I do what God calls me to do, and I'll be blessed with it. And when we start trying to fight for different roles and think, well, I should be doing this, or I want to do this, then you start having friction, you start having problems. That's why the church keeps splitting all the time, because people, through pride, want to be somebody, Galatians 6.3, which we should all be living by. And then suddenly you've got a problem. And even, and we've said this before, even in our small little church here, we can have friction with one another, we do. I cause problems, you cause problems. And uh, we seek unity. We try and get it sorted. And we don't want to step on each other's toes. What God calls you to do, do it. What God calls me to do, do it. We are ministers for him. Paul was called. He's a minister of God to the Gentiles. He took the gospel to the predominantly to the Gentiles, even though he did go to Jews also. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. The dispensation, they call it, of, of the grace of God, the church age, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. God called him. He had a special calling of God. Verse 8, unto me, Paul, who am less than the least of all saints. Do you know what that isn't? That isn't fake humility. That's true humility. We see fake humility everywhere. We've had people in our church that have left. We've got YouTube full of fakers. Fake humility. (laughs) Oh, you wouldn't believe what some people say. I am humble. (laughs) And they don't get it. I'm not prideful. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. He really believed it. Somebody read 1 Timothy 1, 15. Paul says, who am less than the least of all saints. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 1.15, somebody. This is, this uh, is a faithful saying. Yep. And worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. Chief of sinners. The greatest Christian that ever walked the earth calls himself the chief of sinners. And you think you're somebody? You're trying to be somebody? In a world where it promotes the flesh and you can do and be anything you want to, it's very difficult to find people of humility. Paul was a humble man. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Is the, is this grace, this dispensation, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles? He's going to preach among the Gentiles what? The unsearchable riches of Christ. It's unsearchable. It's so deep. It's so loving. It's so compassionate. It's unsearchable. The unsearchable riches of Christ. You could spend your lifetime just looking at that. The unsearchable riches of Christ. There's so much in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's everything, everything good in the world. Jesus Christ is something to do with it. And Paul is doing this before Acts 15. Paul's doing it before Acts 15, which is apparent from his visit to Jerusalem. And you want to have a look at Galatians 2 too there. But in regard to this, just let's pause for a second here. Unto me, Paul says, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. There are a number of unsearchable things about God, about the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody read Philippians 4, 7. Philippians 4, 
7. <clears throat> and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Is it any wonder the apostles, and when they went to prison, and they're, um, you know, in the prison cells, and it's cold, it's freezing, they're starving, and there's no creature comforts like we've got today, and they're there, and they've got their shackles on. They had a peace, like perhaps you and I have never known. He gives us a peace that's beyond understanding. He gives us a peace. You never, once you're saved, once you're in Christ, you should never worry about going to hell. You should never worry about losing your salvation. We have a peace. We're going to go to heaven. Oh, listen, there's a difference. We've said this before many, many times. There's a difference between standing and state. Yeah? You're standing in Christ. You're justified, just as if you've never sinned. You're washed in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're seated together, Ephesians tells us, in heavenly places. You're going to go to heaven. That's your destiny. Nobody can do anything about it. They can whip you, they can torture you, they can take away your possessions, they can take away your family, just like they did with Job. They can take everything away from you. They can, t- they can kill you and take your life away from you. And then suddenly you go absent from body, present with the Lord in heaven. So he gives us a peace. So even in this world of turmoil that we are in, and we see daily and our jobs get us down and we're fighting to pay the bills and we've got problems in the families and all this stuff, all that stuff that, you know, you, you haven't got peace in all that, I can understand. But you've got peace that your sins are done and sorted. You've had this exchange of righteousness, you've given your sins to the Lord Jesus Christ, you've taken his righteousness, you've put on the new man. You're born again, you're blood washed. We're trusting in Jesus Christ. You know, how do you know that you're saved? Listen, I've put all my faith... Every single thing I've got on Jesus Christ. If he fails, I lose. It's as simple as that. If he cannot fail, I cannot fail. I'm my, I am in Christ. Everything I've done, you know, it's not worth anything trying to attain anything to try and get to heaven. So I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's my sure bet. That's the only thing that I've ever placed everything on is Jesus Christ. So he gives us a peace that is beyond understanding. The unsearchable riches of Christ. Let's look at another one. 2 Corinthians 9, 15. 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. His peace is uh, indescribable. You know, we... We pass understanding here. We've got the unsearchable riches of Christ. And what was that one? Unspeakable gift, which is Jesus Christ. We've just so-called celebrated, they talk about it, and they Christmas. Listen, whether you think it's 25th or September, whenever you think Christ was born, thank God he came into the world. The unspeakable gift, the gift of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. You talk about unsearchable things. It's unspeakable. He's unspeakable. It's just incredible how he lays down his life and loved us so much that he gave his life so we could live. Let's look at another one. Song of Solomon 8 verse 7. Song of Solomon 8 verse 7. Somebody grab it. Song of Solomon, 8 verse 7. Anybody, if you're there. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown. If a man would be of all the success of his house for love, it would utterly be content. That's a beautiful verse. His love is unquenchable. Yep, love. What do you love? Who do you love? The Lord Jesus Christ's love for us. For us. It's unquenchable. Love. What is love? God is love. That's where it starts from. God is love. These unsearchable things about God, about the Lord. His love is unquenchable. 1 Peter 1 8. Somebody grab that, please. You could do sermons on all these. 
1 Peter 1 verse 8. Brilliant, what a reader. Hey, whom having seen, whom having not seen, ye love. And it talks about joy unspeakable. You've got a joy in Jesus Christ, unspeakable. People don't understand it. People can't fathom you out. The natural man receiveth the thing, not those things of the spirit. People can't understand why you have this joy. We should be joyous people. We're saved. We're Christians. We're Christians. Live up to the name, folks. What about this one? One, we've done one Peter one eight, didn't we? Two Corinthians twelve four. Two Corinthians twelve four. We have his joy unspeakable. These are some some of the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. We have his peace. His unsearchable, the gift. His unspeakable gift, his love's unquenchable, his joy is unspeakable. What about 2 Corinthians 12, 4? Now if he is brought up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. (laughs) He's not allowed to talk about it. He was caught up into heaven and he saw into the third heaven and he wasn't allowed to write about it. Isn't it amazing that the Apostle Paul wasn't allowed to write about it, but Benny Hinn is? (laughs) <laughs> hey, isn't it amazing these Pentecostal preachers who have been to heaven and seen all these things and said what God looked like on the throne and isn't it amazing they're allowed to write about it in their books <laughs> but Paul in the scriptures wasn't and they just sum it up what charlatans they are words unspeakable I mean one preacher saying once that uh, God doesn't tell us too much about heaven because we'd all go out and commit suicide <laughs> Is that good? <laughs> you just want to get there. Some people are like that. Coming to the end of your life, we were talking about that today, weren't we? You know, and you're coming to the end of your life, and some Christians, they just want to go. I just want to go and be with the Lord. Donna's nan was like that at the end of her life. She's suffering and she's going through some troubles. She was in, how old was she? Nearly 102. Nearly Man, she was causing us some assholes. Now, 102 years old. And she just wanted to go and be with the Lord. What do you want? Are you content? Are you joyous? Are you see these unsearchable riches of Christ? Are you entering into all of this, which the Bible is speaking about? Are you really enjoying life? Hey, that's a question, isn't it? Are you really enjoying life? And if you're not, why not? Is it your fault? Are you making wrong decisions? Do you love life? I love life, yet if the Lord called me home tonight, I can't lose. You know, I'm enjoying myself now. It's the best times of my life. But if I go tonight, I go tonight, I just, I can't lose. It's a win-win. I'm trying to enjoy it as much as I can down here. But when he calls me and I go, I won't believe my eyes. Like Keith Green used to sing, this is like a garbage can to what's going on up there. <laughs> it's amazing. Let's give you a couple more. So we've had the unsearchable things about God. We've had his peace, the gift, love, words, joy. What about this? Psalm 145, verse 3. Psalm 145, verse 3. Somebody read that, Psalm 145.3. If you're there, read it, please. Great is the Lord, and greatness is praise, and his greatness is unsearchable. His greatness is what? Unsearchable. Unsearchable. All these, you know, atheists trying to talk you out of God, so there's no God, spending all their lives trying to prove there is no God. (laughs) Ah, dear, talk about hypocrisy. What's the point? If there's no God, go and do what you want to do. His greatness is unsearchable. We don't understand some of the decisions that he makes. Of course, you know, we're finite beings. He's infinite. We do it differently. We think we know best. 
Isn't it amazing? You make decisions all through your life and you think you know best. And then sometimes the decisions that you make aren't the best. And we mess up. And you think, if only I didn't say that. If only I would have done that. We mess up all the time. Human beings, you try and do what is right, but we mess up. His greatness is infinite. He is all power, all knowing. He knows what's right for us. We just want to allow God to help us to make the right decisions in our lives. In our family life, in our work life, in our church life, with our families. We just want to make the, we want to do the right things. We want to do what is right. Please, Lord, help us. And we've made poor judgments and errors and it's taken us down a different road and we've lost some time in our lives because of that. Some people lose years because of one wrong decision. It takes you somewhere where you shouldn't be. People have wrecked their lives because of one Split decision, that at that specific moment they made the wrong decision and it's ruined their lives. We ought to be going to the Lord and seeking his will for everything and asking him and not rushing into things. Lord, what should I do? Where should I go? We are touching upon the unsearchable riches of Christ. Two more and then we'll move on. Turn to Romans 11, verse 33. So the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out. Could you read that again? That's an amazing verse. Listen to this. So the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Wisdom and knowledge of God, the depth and the riches. How unsearchable are his judgments. Doesn't that tie in beautifully with Ephesians 3, 8? The unsearchable riches of Christ. His judgments are unsearchable. The knowledge and wisdom. In Ephesians 3, we'll come to it, not tonight probably, but verse 10 it talks about here. Might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. We need to know his wisdom. Lord, Give us your knowledge and your wisdom. Help us to understand the scriptures, to rightly divide them. Help us to have discernment in this day and age. And if we lack wisdom, the Bible says we're to ask for wisdom. Do you? When was the last time you prayed for that? Lord, give me wisdom. We pray for all kinds of things. But when do we pray for things like this? Lord, help me to be a better character. Lord, help me to live a holy life. Lord, Rather than saying, Lord, I need this job, or I need to go there, or Lord, can you sort this out in my life? I need to pay the bills, and I need to do all that stuff. Yeah, that's important as well. But shouldn't we be trying to seek God's knowledge and wisdom through his word, and find out what he wants, and where we should go? It is very apt that we, in that film, that it says you're in the situation you're in because of the choices you've made. You can all relate to that to a degree. It's a Christian film. You're in the predicament, you're in the situation you're in today because of the choices that you have made. And not all those choices are good. Some of them are. God willing, the Lord's led us in those. And when we've made the right decisions, we've seen the blessing, we've seen results. We've enjoyed it more. When God's in control and he's leading our lives, it's when we veer off, when we think, I'm going to take back, I'm sort of going to do it my own way. I'll I'll come back in the end, but um, I'm going to do it my own way. That's when things go pear-shaped. That's why it's so important to keep reading and studying the Bible. One more. Job 11, verse 7. Job 11, verse 7. Somebody read it. Come star by searching, find out God. Come star, find out the Almighty and his perfection. Can you read it again, please? Come star by searching, find out God. 
Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? He's past finding out. What books are you going to read? <laughs> you know, you've got the Bible, and we struggle with that, don't we? How often do you read in that? How many hours a day do you spend searching out God, I wonder? Oh, we're good talkers. We can make our YouTube videos. <laughs> but reading the scriptures, that's a different thing, isn't it? He himself is past finding out. How can you understand the Trinity, the Godhead? Oh, there's debates. There's been debates from day one in regard to the Godhead, the Trinity. How can you understand it? How can you understand God? We need God to reveal the scriptures to us, just like he revealed the mystery to Paul. That's what we need. So going back to Ephesians 3. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. We've talked about the local church and how it was um, baptized by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit and um, talking about the body of Christ in Acts 2. Partakers of his promise in Christ. Gentiles got into this body in Christ by the gospel. One gospel that we preach today. Different gospels in the scriptures. And for, again, it's an amazing thing, but how Christians don't get it or don't believe it is is unbelievable. There's different gospels in the scripture, but one gospel that we preach today. Whereof Paul was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. God dispensed something to Paul, this grace that he was to minister to others. People had to come in line and he had to explain to them what God had revealed to him. That's why most of the mysteries were revealed to the Apostle Paul. Given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, he says, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. We've got it good. We've got it so good. I thank God I didn't live in the Old Testament. I thank God even at the time of Christ there was so much persecution here among the Christians. In England, oh yeah, our country's shot through and there's going to be problems coming, I can see it. But I thank God that we can still meet openly. Open the doors, open the scriptures and read this book. And to me I'm... Less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, I think the next verse will take us over our limit this evening. So let's finish there. We're going to pick up from verse 9. Verse 9, Lord willing, next time. Let's try and be, even this week, this weekend, let's try and be the people that God wants us to be. Let's try and make some good decisions if we're making bad decisions. Let's just stop and think and seek God for knowledge and wisdom. And ask him every time we open the scriptures to help us to understand what we read and to rightly divide the word of truth. And that will bless us. That will help us in our daily lives. Let's pray.